How you doing, Steve? Uh, I'm doing very well, thank you. Yeah, good to talk to you, Marcus. <laughs> As I'm, uh, I'm happy. It's a, it's a pleasure to chat with you today. Uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and just jump right in. Uh, okay. So Lionheart's got a new album coming out. Uh, we do. It's coming out on February 23rd uh, worldwide um, on Metalville Records. Uh, and it's called The Grace of a Dragonfly. Okay. And uh, tell me a little bit about what we can expect uh, as far yeah, as the, the sound and and then uh, kind of the plans on what's coming. Right. Um, yeah, we, we started this album pretty much as soon as we finished the, uh, the, the previous album, The Reality of Miracles. Uh, I mean, as a producer, I'm not the kind of guy that once I finished a project that I listen back to what I've done too much. I like to kind of push forward. Uh, so we started writing songs for this new album uh, about three years ago. And uh, I mentioned, I just thought to myself, how can we progress this album on from uh, the previous albums? What can we do? It's a little bit different. And it just occurred to me that maybe we could do like a concept album or a themed album. Uh, and I mentioned this to our singer, Lee Small, and he, uh, he loved the idea. And he, he said, well, let's do it about uh, World War II. Um, I was a bit nervous, to be honest, about doing uh, a themed album about war because uh, I'm very, very anti-war. I, I don't, you know, I don't agree that war is the way to solve the world's problems. And, um, and so I, I discussed this with Lee and we, we agreed that we would basically come up with a bunch of songs that uh, concentrated more on the humane side of, uh, of war, the, uh, you know, what ordinary citizens have to go through and the suffering they have to go through. Um, and also try and kind of give it a, a positive spin, you know, that, that hopefully we can uh, think about leaving war as a solution, uh, as an apparent solution, because it never really is, and uh, moving to a, a period of, of, you know, more peace and understanding and, and tolerance, I think, more than anything else uh, between nations. And so that's what we try to bring across on this album. And I think uh, uh, Lee Lee's lyrics were fantastic, and I, I think he's done a great job doing that. Uh, that's really awesome. Um... And refreshing, you know, I mean, obviously with, with uh, rock and punk and metal and, and stuff over the decades, you know, it's easy to fall into just writing about war and violence and hatred and all the ugliness of the world. And, you know, there is a lot of ugly in the world, unfortunately, but there's also a lot of beautiful things and a lot of positive things to look forward to. And you would think being in 2024 that we would have found ways to better achieve just living peacefully and coexisting. But for some reason, it's just a problem, you know, and, and it's, yeah, it ducks, you know, I, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, to, to be honest, Marcus, I think probably 99.9% .9 of the world's population agree with you. I mean, I think they, you know, they're peace loving. They don't want war. Uh, they just want to live, you know, live with their fellow neighbor, whatever their religion and their, you know, ethnicity is, they just want to live in peace. But it's that 0.1% who get themselves, you know, into positions of power and, you know, become dictators. And, um, you know, we, we all know who I'm talking about, yeah. who, um, <laughs> who ruin it, for, you know, for the, for the whole world. <laughs> you know, and it's, um, you know, so we're, we're, we're there as a vast, vast majority. But, you know, the problem is, are these, is this small minority of people who are of madmen, to be honest. Anyway, <clears throat> so you know you you've had quite a quite quite a kick-ass career, you know, and you've been in lots of projects and lots of bands. And um, what what are your some some of your proudest accomplishments so far? Oh, uh, there have been many. Um, I I. I think uh, I have to say this album, I mean, the, the Lionheart album that's coming up, um, 
because of COVID, we weren't able to, to tour for a couple of years. And so I was able to, to really kind of get up. I've got my studio is based in my home. Mm-hmm. And I was able to get up in the morning and um, and go into the studio and start work and and essentially just pour my heart out into into the recording studio here uh, and just really kind of uh, express myself and um, kind of on you know as a producer of this of this album and uh, so I think this this album probably is going to be as far as music's concerned is going to be my um, my what it's certainly one of my proudest moments uh, I think um, when we played Monsters of Rock in 1986 with the Macaulay Schenker Group uh, in Mannheim and Nuremberg, um, and we had an audience of I think um, 50,000. I think that was for me at the time uh, a, a remarkable moment. Um, also playing at Loud, but we headlined Loud Park in 2018 in Tokyo, um, and that was a fantastic moment. I mean, just you know, Sabaton were on before us, and and then we walked out onto the stage, and the, the I think it's thirty five thousand people um, just erupted, and <laughs> that was uh, that, that was <laughs> serious shivers down the spine. Um, there, there's been a lot of a lot of moments, you know. Uh, I think way too many to explain, but certainly you know those were a couple of my uh, my most proud moments. Sure, and uh, it, it, you. You went back to the 80s on that, and then you talked about more recently and still being able to go out in front of massive crowds. And I'm sure that it it feels good and lively to be able to still, um, I'm sure, you know, get nervous and um, goosebumps and, and, you know, get that excitement in your chest. Yeah, it, it never changes, you know. I mean, the... I remember when I played my because I, I played pubs up until I was about uh, let me work it out I was about twenty, uh, and then I joined a band called Liar and we went out on tour with Slade, okay, and uh, we were playing two thousand seaters because Slade was still pretty big in those days, and um, and I stood in the wings and I just thought. Am I going to freeze? You know, I've never played in front. I've played in front of 20, 25 people in a pub before. Uh, am I going to walk out on that stage and freeze? I just didn't know. And I thought there's only one way to find out, and that's just to stand there and do it. So, you know, the curtain went up and we were introduced and I walked on stage and started playing. And much to my delight, <laughs> my fingers didn't freeze up and my legs carried on walking and, and I realized I was going to be okay. Um, you know, and since, of course, the adrenaline was pumping around then and the excitement level was up to here and uh, it, it never changes. You know, you, you, you've you done, I mean, I've done hundreds, thousands of shows in my 50 year career. And um, when I walk out on stage these days, it's exactly the same. You know, I mean, I might be fast asleep, you know, dozing an hour before we go on stage. And then in that hour, you start to think, yes. You know, the gig's coming up, and as you walk out on stage, it's never any different. You always have the adrenaline pumping around. You walk out, the cheer goes up, and it's uh, you have that rapport with the audience, and uh, it's it's a fantastic feeling, you know, and it's something that you can never explain to anybody that hasn't actually been on a stage and done it themselves. It is uh, it's quite remarkable, and it's something that I'm, I just feel blessed and very, very lucky that uh, I can still do it, you know, at my age. <laughs> Which I won't tell you what that is. <laughs> now it's a bit older than you, though. <laughs> but um, so all these things that you've done, what 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 goals do you still have for yourself at this point? Um, my goal is to just keep keep bettering myself. I I, I never ever get fed up of of. You know, as, as we were just talking about, I play music live and I never, ever get fed up of recording music either. I love to sit in my studio and, and put stuff down. And I'm just, you know, I spend an hour a day maybe practicing guitar. And, I, you know, the great thing we have these days is YouTube videos. And if I feel that my right hand technique is not really coming up to scratch, I'll just 
type into YouTube, you know, uh, alternate picking, you know, uh, what to practice, you know. And I, I'm, I'm like a young kid in that sense, and you know, I've always wanted to, to get better and better. And um, same with my songwriting. And, you know, so I, I think as long as I'm uh, achieving more and more, then, uh, you know, th there's kind of very few goals. I did an interview yesterday. Somebody said, what is there something in your bucket list uh, that you would want to do above anything else? And uh, it made me think. And I came up with one, which was to play with a beetle. Uh, and I've always wanted to play with a beetle of some sort. There's only two left now. There's Ringo Starr and there's Paul McCartney. Uh, and if I had my choice of the two, it would be Paul McCartney. But uh, I guess that would be the one thing that I would like to still achieve in my life. Uh, it's unlikely to happen, but Paul, if you're watching this. <laughs> Come on, Paul. Remember me. Remember me. <laughs> uh, now, that, that would be unbelievable. Um, <laughs> What, if Paul was watching this? <laughs> right? Yeah, I can. Yeah. I, I wish Paul McCartney watch my stuff. Or, or Ringo, yeah. for that matter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting distracted out here. Um, I'm, I'm actually at work. Ah. And, I, and I'm doing this at work, too. So, oh, cool. so you're being paid for this? <laughs> yeah, uh, technically, yes, I am getting paid for this. <laughs> yeah, good kind of job. <laughs> um, oh, so who were your guitar heroes growing up? You know, once you started playing and all that, who who were you looking to the most? Uh, when I first I bought, bought my first electric guitar when I was 15 years old, and um, I just discovered uh, Eric Clapton. My brother was five years older than me, and he was well into heavy rock at that time. And um, I think it was called Progressive Rock or something back then. And and uh, he had an album called Goodbye Live or Goodbye Cream, I think it was, um, with obviously Eric Clapton playing. And, and there were three. The first side of the album were, were two tracks where they just jammed. And the second side was one track where they played live. And then I think they had a few studio tracks after that. And I just played the album uh, over and over and over again and listened to what Clapton was doing. So he was a big influence on me uh, in the very early days. Uh, then I moved on to uh, Alvin Lee from 10 years after. Uh, Richie Blackmore became a massive influence. Um, uh, then I listened to people like um, uh, Alan Holdsworth, um, Aldi Miola. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then Gary Moore later when he came along, a um, bit of Michael Schenker before he, I ever joined his band. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's been a lot uh, of influences, you know, and I, I kind of put it all into a, you know, I don't deliberately copy anybody, but just kind of get ideas and, you know, I might hear Blackmore play a really nice little blues riff or something and think, oh, yeah, that's nice. And I'll remember it in my head and then I'll try it when I get home. And uh, that kind of goes in my uh, my little toolbox of riffs. And the whole lot just kind of gets mixed around and it comes out as your own style in the end. Uh, I think a major influence for me recently has been Steve Lukather. I say recently, I mean, probably for the last 30 years. Um, you know, everything he does, I just, I'm amazed at. But uh, I'll very often hear a guitar player, um, pretty obscure guitar player that I just think, oh, that's good. And I'll hear a riff and it will be logged. Um, Guthrie Govan is another guy that I just, I don't try and copy him because nobody can. He's just probably the most amazing guitar player in the world for me. Um, so there's a lot of different influences come up and I, I just kind of pick the bits that I like and then try and add my own thing to it and do it in my own way and uh, try and keep to melody. You know, I, I, I don't try and prove anything or prove how many arpeggios I can do per bar. I just I like to play melodies. And I like to play a solo where people can listen to it and then, you know, they go away from the song whistling the solo. Uh, and if they do that, then I've done a good job as far as I'm concerned. So uh, I try and keep my own style amongst all of the, the uh, influences. Okay. <clears throat> so are, are, you, um, are, are you living in the UK still? Uh, no. <laughs> Funnily enough, back in 86, when I first joined Michael Schenker's band, 
um, I was living in the UK and I came over to Hanover to rehearse and to record uh, because Michael was living here. Um, and then I set up a studio here and I met my future wife and ended up staying here in Hanover. And in the meantime, Michael moved to the UK. So I'm always traveling between Germany and the UK or the UK and Germany to work with Michael. But we, we never live in the same country together. We always <laughs> seem to swap countries somehow. So, uh, yeah, so right now I'm living in Hanover, Germany. It's a lovely place. I love it here. Okay. Uh, it's, it's funny because I've talked to quite a few people from Germany in the last few months. And um, it doesn't matter where anyone's from. Uh, I like to ask this. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask you if, if I came to Germany, which I, I, I plan to eventually, um, where would you recommend that I go as far as just whether it's food or sightseeing or, you know, music or whatever? Yeah, I think, uh, um, Hanover, where I live, is was always a rock town. Uh, there's a great music scene here. It's it's declined a bit in the last few years, uh, but there's some great bands here, some great musicians. Um, you know, you can always get out to clubs and see some 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 really great rock bands. Um, in terms of seeing sights, I think probably the further towards South Germany you go, the the better the sights get. Um, you know, if you like walking or hiking then uh, you should go to uh, it's a place called Harz, uh which it's like a, a range of hills that divides East Germany, old East Germany and old West Germany uh, which is obviously now reunited um, but if you go down to uh, kind of past Frankfurt towards southern Germany then uh, you'll get to see some fantastic uh, palaces and castles down there you know so Depending on what you're into, you know, there's some, and if you like beer, go to Munich. You know, that's, <laughs> that's the place for the beer. <laughs> that, that's the answer I always give. The, <laughs> you got to have the beer. It's like, well, you know, beer, if I yeah. go to Germany, I'm going to have a beer. <laughs> yeah. Well, in that case, Munich's great. You know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an international city and the people are really friendly down there. It's a bit expensive, but, you know, it's, uh, it's a, it's a great town, a great city. And, uh, you know, I, I, go down there sometimes for business and I love to go down there. I always try and have an extra day down there so I can just kind of have a walk around the city. It's a, it's a, it's a really, so if there's one place to go to that I'd recommend, it would be Munich. I like it. So after, after the album comes out, um, what, what's the rest of 2024 and even 2025 looking like? Yeah, we, um, Normally, it's been very hard to work on the Lionheart album because we've all had uh, different gigs. I mean, obviously, I've had Michael Schenker. Um, Dennis has been working with various bands, so is Clive, Rocky, and Lee. Uh, this year, it's for some reason the uh, the gigs on the live front. Maybe it's kind of a a thing about post COVID because there are a lot of shows that were that were booked but then cancelled uh, back in 2020 and 2021. Um, and 2022 and 2023, I think, saw a big catch up. So bands that had cancelled tours were going out and, and doing those tours as a postponed tour. Um, it could be now that things are just starting to kind of lighten up a bit on the touring front, that all of the catching up has been done. Certainly on the MSG side of things, we're, uh, I think we, we have two festivals in for next, uh, next year, for this year so far. Um, so it's pretty light on the on the touring front. Um, so we are thinking that this actually might be a good chance now for Lionheart to get out there and start to do a few shows. Um, so we were talking today about putting a live set together. We've already got Wonder Festival booked in October in Manchester, England. And we're looking at um, yeah, finding a you know a half decent booking agency and then putting a few uh, a few more shows. So hopefully this will be a good year. If you want to go and see Lionheart, um, to do that, we're thinking also maybe Japan might be a, a an option. Um, we went to Japan in 2017, so maybe we can organise another Jap Japan tour for Lionheart. Uh, 2025, probably doing the new album. I would imagine. <laughs> okay, keeping busy, you know. <laughs> Always keep that train rolling. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I never, never have the problem with twiddling my thumbs and thinking, what can I do now? <laughs> well, Steve, 
Do, do you have any any last uh, parting words for longtime fans and even fans to be? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, basically, just just thank you so much. Um, when we got back together again in 2016, we thought it was just a going to be a one-off gig that we did and uh, at this festival and uh, we had such an amazing response from everybody worldwide who saw the the uh, the festival performance on YouTube um, we were just absolutely knocked knocked over with the response so thank you very very much that you never gave up on us you never forgot us uh, you went out and bought our albums um, that means an awful lot and, and we still find it difficult to believe that there's a lot of Lionheart fans out there um, and as you say we've made a lot of new fans too so uh, we hope we can uh, keep producing the goods and keep doing better and better albums for you we certainly have uh, all the enthusiasm to do it and I think we're going to get better and better so thank you for hanging on in there and uh, I hope you enjoy the new album go out and don't stream it go out and buy it <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those people that like to buy stuff, you know. Good. Uh, there's a very good reason for buying it, and that's the artwork by Tristan Greatrix, who's who did Second Nature and The Reality of Miracles, has absolutely uh, outdone himself on this album. The artwork is just stunning. And uh, if you stream it, you won't see the artwork. Sorry, but that's how it works. <laughs> uh, buy the CD, or even better, buy the vinyl, and you'll get... Big artwork. There's a great circle of bands insert in there. It is uh, a really fantastic uh, booklet. All the lyrics and everything and credits and little stories are in there. So uh, go and buy it and have a have a complete experience. <laughs> Steve, I love your positivity and your enthusiasm and your energy. And uh, I look forward to the new album. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you live one of these days. And Absolutely. Uh, I, I totally appreciate your time. You, you've been awesome. And thank you very much for, for chatting with me. Yeah, thank you, Marcus. It's been great talking to you. And if you find yourself coming to Germany, just look me up and, uh, and we'll hook up. <laughs> All right, Steve, man. I appreciate it. Okay, Marcus. Take care, man. Yeah, you too. Yeah, see you.